Hey, welcome to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction. More importantly, it's about recovery, and it's brought to you by our friends at KnowYourScript.org. KnowYourScript.org, a wealth of knowledge when it comes to talking to yourself, to your doctors, to your loved ones, to family members about opioids. Is there a safer alternative? What should I be doing? How do I store them? Where do I put them? All of that can be found right there at KnowYourScript.org. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. He's a clinical psychologist. Just wrapping up Christmas, uh, I, right. can, I can tell you from the Scott household and the Harris household because that's my girlfriend's last name. Double household. Yeah, and yep. uh, it's it, it's amazing. Uh, my girlfriend really goes above and beyond when it comes to holiday. Like she has. Have you ever seen that show with um, who's the gladiator guy? Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe. The Beautiful Mind. Yeah, you yeah. know, and he's got all schizophrenia. Those, all those things. Well, my girlfriend doesn't have schizophrenia. Okay, good. But you know how he's got all those pictures on the walls, and mm-hmm. you look up there and you go, "That's just a jumbly mess." But to him, it makes sense. Yeah, that's how she can look at an Amazon account. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's just like, I go, what are your, sh-? and she goes, you know, and just saving deals and getting Her this. beautiful mind just processes oh, it, it, all of that. It's like a computer. I believe it. You know, and uh, it, it, it's pretty cool. So my kids had a wonderful Christmas. Uh, her kids had a wonderful Christmas and everything was just good. And now we're gearing up for the new year. How was your Christmas, Dr. Matt? It was great. We uh, went up to my parents' house in Morgan for Christmas Eve. A good old country Christmas Eve? Yeah, my sister and her family came in from Oregon and and got together, so it was fun. We did that and then just went back to the house in Bountiful and hung out. We're, my kids are older than your kids, uh-huh. so Christmas is a lot more laid back. Everybody still loves it, but nobody's waking up at the crack of dawn. It's really the best time for Christmas because I can sleep in, you know, eight o'clock rolls around and yeah. get around to it, you know. So, so we've got Bowden uh, and he's 10. Uh, yeah, so, is, he, is he a crack of dawn oh, Christmas yeah. he's morning like, hey, guy? get up. The elf came, dad. Yeah, 4.30. Have, he's oh, like, yeah, let's yeah. do it. Yeah, he's setting traps. He's putting powdered sugar on there to track the tracks. <laughs> and yeah, he's doing all that stuff. Awesome. So it, it's a it's a magical time of year. Uh, and then when that's all said and done, Dr. Matt, people start looking to the new year. We got this week in between. Mm -hmm. where a lot of people are off work or doing less work, a lot of just kind of uh, recuperating, I think, and getting ready for a fun New Year's Eve. And and I've never been a big fan of New Year's Eve uh, because to me it's kind of – there's this huge buildup, and there's supposed to be something magical that happens, and then all this stuff. And It's like Valentine's. It's it's like it feels made up. Yeah. So one time when I was drinking – Yeah. Um. I was drinking a lot. Mm-hmm, we know. I, I was DJing a, a New Year's Eve party. Uh huh. And um, I was 10 seconds late on New Year's. <laughs> My buddy goes, I go. <laughs> the I ball go. dropped and you're like, 10, <laughs> nine. It was, it was not good. I didn't get paid that night. <laughs> It was, it was, it was, <laughs> that must have been bad. Then. It was not you good. You kind of have to be on time that one time. Yeah, yeah. Right? I remember my, all your other jobs through the year, you could be 10 seconds yeah, late. But like all one. my friends would be like, hey, remember when you were 10 seconds late on New Year's? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> See, I would have thought you liked New Year's because you, you like to party and you, you have a lot of fun friends and you guys go do fun stuff. And no, I mean, I, I, I did for that reason, at, you know, alone. It was a big party. But then when you, you start... But to it's kind of artificial, right? It kind of feels made up. It's like, okay, you watch the ball drop on TV. Well, I'll tell you right now, for like real drinkers, which I consider myself because I'm an alcoholic, yeah, uh, it's amateur night. Oh, okay. You know, it's where all the guys come to the bar, all the girls come to the bar, they get really stupid drunk and all that stuff. And then one time, you know, the year that the bar is really packed and you're like... Where are you guys the rest of the days, man? Yeah. You know what I mean? You guys, you know, I just got posers. Gotta, yeah, posers. I'm here all the time. Right. You guys should show up one day and make it take an hour to get a drink. Go back home. They should make a New Year's resolution not to be a po- no. They should. But but that's it's funny that you bring up New Year's resolutions because it's also the time where a lot of self reflection is happening and people will start to say, well, you know, 2022, it's going to be a new year, a new me, mm-hmm. or you know, th- it's going to be different, or this is what I'm going. And I hear a lot of people say, New Year, New me yeah i've heard that and sometimes not sometimes it just rubs me wrong because i don't think the new year needs a new you i think the new year Mm. needs a better you i I think sometimes we need to look back and look at the things that make us unique that make us who we are the good the bad and the ugly because we all have them we live in this world where it's social media glamorizes all the good things Mm -hmm. and it never talks about any of the bad things no in fact you hardly ever 
see anything but you know somebody's buying a new car they're on vacation in some amazing place and I mean, the reality is we yeah. don't know if that's a vacation or if that's a green screen or the car you're in front of is really yours you're just There's putting out so the world just that. to flex yeah. Yeah. And, and and do that but i have learned more in these past three years about myself and who i am and what makes me happy and where i want to be because for the first time in my life i was sober and able to look inside and go, what am I really about? Do, what do I want to be? What do I want to be remembered as? What 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 makes me me? And and yeah, I I've said it on this podcast and the other podcast I did with Tom. Um, you know, I'm a selfish person, and I know that. But I also tell people that I'm a selfish person. Uh, I, I'm not always selfish, but I will do what I want to do. I think you're less selfish than you used to be, though. That's Pretty, my opinion. Yeah, I'm um, observing because. I think of what you're talking about, the self-reflection uh, and realizing that by not being selfish, you get more of what you want. Yeah. But if, but if I sat and told you that I'm perfect and I'm always right. things, well, yeah. yeah, but no, but there's certain times that I'm selfish and sure. I, and, and I want to do what I want to do and I'm going to try to make it go my way. I've also know my, when to pick my battles now and I go, well, this ain't worth it. Prime example, me and my girlfriend, uh, I was golfing a lot. And I was golfing every Saturday and Sunday. You were, what, four or five days a week? Easy. Four days at least yeah, yeah. a week. Yeah. And I was golfing every Saturday and Sunday. And my girlfriend sat me down. And to be fair, my ex-wife sat me down when I was doing this when we were married. And she goes, do you think that's okay? Do you think it's cool that you go golfing every Saturday and Sunday and just leave me to do whatever I want? And I go, well, you can do whatever you want. She goes, I want to be with you. Mm-hmm. That's a good girlfriend answer. You know, and, and I go, well, yeah, but we can be after just, but it's always on your time. And I go, yeah. You know what? So here's the deal. I'm not going to go both days. And, <laughs> that was a tough sell to me, man. Well, I'm, I mean, I would imagine that's a big Because yeah, I'm used to doing sacrifice. what I want when yeah, I want. I hear you. But that's not how the real world works. And so. So is that a new you now? Or is that a different version of you? It's that, a better me. Okay. It's a less selfish version of me. Yeah. And there's times that I, I'm still selfish, but I want to go back and talk about that. You don't need a new you. You need a better you. You are enough. You are unique. You are wonderful. You are beautiful. You are you are a disaster. You're all these things. So I, I have to confess something. Yeah. I know I make fun of you for getting your news on uh, Facebook. Uh huh. But I learned something from Facebook actually just this morning. Uh, not in preparation to talk to you about this because I didn't know this is what we were going to talk about. Um, I, you know, there's a little uh, interview clip with Anthony Hopkins. Sir Anthony Hopkins. Sir Anthony. And I love him. He's he's always kind of an interesting guy. If I remember, I think he's in recovery. He's in recovery, yeah. he's And I actually thought that's what it was going to be. And I don't know if this interview was associated with recovery or not. But I, I clicked on, actually clicked on the audio so I could hear him because I like his voice. And he said, the, the interviewer said, uh, do you have, you know, kind of looking back on your life, your career, do you have any regrets? And he thought about it for a second. You could tell he, he didn't have a ready to go answer. And he said something to the effect. So don't, you know, pretend I'm quoting him. But he said something to the effect of, no, um, I've, uh, I don't have any regrets. Life's too short for that. And then he goes on to explain. He said, I've been a good man. I've been a bad man. I've done good things. I've done bad things. At some point, you just have to learn from those things, forgive yourself and move on and be the best person you can be today. That's what I'm talking about, yeah. Sir Anthony Hopkins. Right. Because, I mean, that's the, that's the reality of where we are in the world we live in. And they tell you that when you're in recovery. You know what I mean? You can't live in the past, and you can't predict the future. And if you try to do both those things, you're just crushing the present. And well, that's all we have. And don't you think that this uh, there's this element that you've probably seen when you were in recovery, and I've seen it in therapy, people sometimes are running away from who they are. Yes, and that means ditching the good parts of yourself as well. They're trying to run away from that. And running away doesn't work because everywhere you go, there you are, right? You're stuck yep. with yourself. And so it, people who uh, can't accept themselves for who they are can't really get a baseline for improving themselves. And so that kind of dovetails into one of the things that is that, you know, this statement rubs you wrong. One that really rubs me wrong is people will say I'm broken. 
Oh. And I get that. I get it. Oh, boy. I know that people feel broken sometimes. I felt broken when, sure. when, when all my friends could seem to drink like gentlemen right. or walk away from a beer or they didn't ruin their lives. They didn't get yeah. a DUI. They didn't get in a crash. They didn't almost kill people. And I thought, why am I broken? I'm eternally There's broken. There's something wrong with me. Yeah. And I get that. I get the feeling. So I have empathy for that. But I don't really like the sentiment. I certainly don't like it in therapy because I have a developmentalist point of view mm-hmm. as a therapist. And that is... Is that we're all in development from the moment we are born to the moment we die we're in development we're in the process of becoming who we are and the minute that process stops we stop growing and, and problems start so if you can look at yourself and think maybe uh, despite my age there are aspects of me that are underdeveloped maybe even though I'm 50 years old maybe there's some maturities and things that I never really developed for various reasons. And if I look at myself as underdeveloped, I think that's much healthier and more, you can get motivated and optimistic about the fact that, yeah, I'm not broken per se. I don't need a brand new version of me. Mm -mm. I just need to develop myself. And some parts of my development are spot on and maybe even advanced, but then there are aspects of myself that I still need to work on. And so for people in recovery, I think that's a healthier way to see yourself because it's motivating to realize, hey, some parts of myself are fantastic and I've spent a lot of time developing good qualities, but there are some of these other ones that maybe in this new year I could target for some some more specific development. And I think that's a healthier way of setting uh, New Year's resolutions as opposed to um, New Year, New Me. In the Scott household, when it was Christmas or birthdays or summer or whatever, and something was delivered that needed to be put together, mm. I was your guy. You are the man. I was, this, I was the guy in the family that would take it out of the box and put it together. Yeah. Now, here's the thing I used to pride myself on. Not having to read instructions? I don't have to read the instructions. <laughs> Come on, it. man. This is, I got this figured it's, out. It's for chumps. I got, I, I got this figured out. And you could use this as a metaphor for life. And there were some times that I didn't need the instructions. I put it together and it's still working to this day or it's still assembled and everything's good. But every once in a while I'd get to some place and I'd be like, this is broken. <laughs> I, they just must have sent me the wrong things. Yeah. And my Why mom, do I have all these extra screws? Yeah, extra parts. Yeah. They don't come with extra parts, my mom would say. <laughs> and so every once in a while my mom or my dad or my brother should be like, hey, why don't you read the instructions? Yeah. So I'd read the instructions and just realize that I didn't do one thing here, I didn't do that, and if I did that, all of a sudden uh, it's back together. Right. Sometimes we just need a little instructions, a little help. So that brings me to a point I want to talk with you, because when people reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, uh, emails, whatever they do, they, you know, they're know they looking for help. They're looking to get pointed in some direction. Uh, and and my, my first go-to is, have they seen a therapist? I never thought I would be a guy promoting therapy as much as I do, but I go, have they seen a therapist? Because a therapist is usually a good jumping off point. They can help them kind of figure out what's going on and where to go and then navigate them in the direction that they need to be. I think that's true, of course. I mean, that's my profession, uh, part of my profession. But um, I, I think that what's great about a therapist is it's not a friend. It's not a family member. They don't it's, have any skin in the game. They, yeah, they're, they're just there to let you talk and listen and advise and sometimes help you see things like the instructions that you're talking about yeah. that you didn't see, steps that maybe you skipped, um, looking at things from a different point of view because they don't have skin in the game. But I know therapists are in high demand right now. Uh, I, I know right. people who have been like, I've got an appointment with a therapist, but it's not until late January or early sure. February. And, and, and that seems to be pretty standard right now. Unfortunately, yeah. I, I wish that were not the case, but it is. So before we go to break, I want to ask you this question. Is there reading material? Is there books? Or is there certain maybe people could go to to kind of – get some insight themselves. So I don't want to say therapy for dummies, you know, those books mm-hmm. that have, you know, subjects on everything, but is there some out there that, you know, can help people kind of go, well, maybe this is a road I should go down. I'm going to give you, uh, I'll give you some book ideas when we come back from the break. Uh, but I do have two in mind right now. I think a good book can be very, very helpful. It's not a replacement for a therapist, but in the meantime, while you're waiting to get into your see your therapist, yeah, I have some ideas. I also want to talk about uh, meditation and what it can do for the soul. You're listening to Project Recovery right here on KSL. 
Welcome back to Project Recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. What you're getting today is kind of a hodgepodge of kind of meanderings that are going through our head, through our minds, uh, to prepare you for the new year. I think we're unwinding between Christmas and New Year's right That's now. That's what, yeah. We're, this is like the Canadian uh, version of Bo- Boxing Day. Boxing Day. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're just unpacking everything, just letting it out and, and getting yeah. ready to go. Before we took a break, uh, we were talking about the importance or the benefits of finding a good therapist which is hard to do right now right? Uh, because uh, they are in demand through the pandemic and COVID and people's anxiety and, and everything is heightened right now. Uh, so I asked you, is there a book that people could go to uh, to maybe to get them through until they can find a therapist or maybe see if this is something that they want to explore? And you said you got two books in mind. I have two books in mind. Um, and the funny thing is, uh, I think people think, uh, or at least people ask me this question, do you have a book to recommend for this or I that? I don't want to read anything by Freud. <laughs> I don't have any mom issues. Yeah, nobody does, right? Um, <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't really have a lot of books that I recommend. That's the truth. Um, I don't peruse the self-help shelves because it's become such a business. But there are a few authors that are legit and there are some books that are very helpful. And I absolutely 100% believe that if you're serious about improving yourself, mm-hmm. making changes, getting healthier mentally and emotionally, uh, doing that development we talked about earlier in the show, then you can't just expect to have a walk in and have a therapist fix it for you one hour a week. There are things you need to be doing in between. And a good therapist knows that and they'll be helping you with it. And one of those is reading. There are some good reading materials out there. So let's start with a book by Martin Seligman with an S. Mm -hmm. Seligman. He's the real deal. Past president of American Psychological Association. The founder of Positive Psychology Research Center at University of Pennsylvania. He's not just some guy writing books for you. And uh, he has written a book. uh, It's about a decade old now called Learned Optimism. Learned optimism. Now, I know you brought this up before on the podcast. I have, yep. Uh, And you said uh, optimism is a skill and a trait. It's a trait. Uh, Optimism is a trait that's highly associated with uh, happiness and success, positivity, people who rate high in optimism, um, everything in life is better for them. They're more educated. They make more money. They like their jobs more. They have happier relationships, all those good things. They're healthier. So there's a lot of research that goes into the fact that optimism is a trait. And the cool thing is it's a trait you can improve on. So regardless of where you've started in life, Mm -hmm. if you were born as super optimistic or if you're a little negative Nelly, doesn't matter where you started, you can improve. And so learned optimism is a, is a book that, uh, has a test in it. It tells you where you're at really? on on the optimism scale. Uh, it gives you exercises. He ha- he's actually unlike a lot of psychologists. He's an interesting writer. Mm-hmm. Like he's kind of funny and entertaining. So he has a lot of good examples and analogies that help you understand the concept. He talks about research, but in an interesting way. Um, he has a TED talk that. If you're, if you're like, well, I'm not going to buy a book, well, at least at least take 23 minutes and listen to his TED Talk, Martin Seligman, and uh, learned optimism. You can use cognitive and behavioral skills to improve and increase your optimism and therefore just improve your life. Pessimism is associated with depression. So if you're walking around, if Christmas has been hard for you, if the inversion and the darker days and all of those things are tough... You could use a dose of optimism. So I I would say that would be a good one. I used to say, uh, you know, people say, is your cup half empty or your cup half full? I used to say I was just happy to have a cup because now I'm in the game. And so it's up to me whether I want to fill it or don't fill it. Right. And I used to tell my dad that I was an optimist. And my dad, who's got this kind of regal voice. Yes, he does. He's he's always got an answer. Your dad should play like a general in a... In an army movie or He's something. He's been in a movie with Scott Glenn called uh, Slaughter of the Innocents. It was filmed here in Utah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah, he was also in Reuben and Ed. Ah, oh, Reuben and Ed. Yeah, he was yeah. in that. He got hit in the nose by Karen Black. But uh, he would go, you know, there's optimist, there's pessimist, I'm a realist. And I'd be like, what does that mean? He goes, it is what it is. And I go, it's not. I don't believe that. I don't believe yeah. is what it is. When people say is what it is. So I'm going to say this at the risk of getting punched in the nose by your dad. Everybody who tells me that they're a realist, they're just a pessimist in disguise. <laughs> that's the truth? <laughs> no, I get it. It's, that's just the truth. He goes, is what it is. And I go, no, it is what you want it to be. It's There's- your perception that determines your reality. I, I 100% believe that. And it's how you look at things that determines your experience in life. And if you have a pessimistic uh, bent 
on what you're seeing, then all the emotions that come with pessimism, like like feeling depressed and down and you know anxious, anxious and, and all those things, that's going to be part of your experience. Optimists, the only time, and Seligman points this out in the book, the only time that it's probably a little bit better to be a pessimist than an optimist is when your life is on the line. Ah. So, you know, if you're like, well, I'm going to go parachuting. Should I check my parachute one more time to make sure it's <laughs> packed right? Nah, I'm okay. That's not the best time to be an optimist. The dude with the Grateful Dead shirt looks like he knows what he's doing. Yeah, yeah. I'm all right. I'm all right. Yeah, we're, the pessimist lives longer in those, ca- in those sorts of cases. But other than life and limb, the optimist wins out in life. Let me ask you this, uh, because we don't really have a script for today or n- any day. Um, what about Brene Brown? Uh, a lot of people swear by this lady, and, and when I was in recovery, there was there was many she classes. Has a lot of great things to there say. There was many yeah. classes that we would sit down and, and 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 listen to her talking about shame, and and she has some some great TED talks. And there's like in the recovery world, she is everywhere. Yeah. Uh, tell for the people at home who maybe haven't heard of Brene Brown. Do you know anything about her? Uh, all I know is uh, I think. I don't actually know if she's a psychologist or if she's a social worker, mm-hmm. uh, but I know she's a mental health professional. She, I think, has been or perhaps still is a lecturer somewhere at a university. Um, she's very charismatic. She's done She's done a good service to mental health in general because she's been able to package positive messages that are fairly grounded as far everything I've noticed of hers, and um, I'm not promoting her, yeah. uh, but Me it seems, seems grounded in what we know. In psychology so that's you know research wise so she just has a great way of packaging and bringing that to people in a way that makes sense to them and to be honest that's a criticism I have of the field of psychology is a bunch of pinheads you know doing research in labs and writing books that really are only for us and we haven't done a good job as a field getting the info out to people and so Brene Brown's one of those that has done a, a, new light a good it. job bringing yeah. it out so I don't you know other than that I've never read a Brene Brown book. I've seen quotes and I've listened to her talk a couple of times about that kind of thing. So the name of the first book again? Learned Optimism. Okay. And you can even get the, there's an audio version. You said there was two books and I kind of know where you're going with this, uh, but coming from two divorced guys. Uh, yeah. Marriage. Right, right. Marriage. Well, right now, uh, with COVID, a lot of couples have been sort of trapped together. And I've known some couples where that's improved their marriage. They're like, this is fantastic. We get more time together. We both are working from home. But that might be the exception. What I'm hearing a lot is being together all this, we we have spent a lot of years in our marriage ignoring problems that we can't ignore anymore. And now they're coming to a head. And now they're coming to a head. And I probably should have looked up the author because for, I'm forgetting the author's name. But Fighting for Your Marriage is a, is a good place to start if you're waiting to get into a couple's counselor. Uh, what's great about somebody who, and, th- and this is where you need to listen, uh, just like not all teachers teach the same thing, not all doctors treat the same thing, not all therapists do the same thing. And so if you're, you should be working with somebody who is a couples therapist or has a lot of background and research, excuse me, training in, in couples counseling and couples therapy. Howard J. Markman. That's right. Markman, uh, fighting for your marriage. That's a very good place to start. And I know it seems a little awkward, but, um, that would be a good book to read together and talk about. Now, some some couples, their relationship may be so tense at this point that they can't do that. But if you're unsatisfied with your marriage uh, or your partnership and uh, you feel like this just isn't working out, that would be a good place to start while you're waiting to get in and work with a therapist. You know, and, and I, but I think that's pretty common, uh, not just with, you know, marriages, but with the pandemic is a lot of people were isolated and left by themselves and trying to figure out what's going on. And so the, the reading's not a bad way to get your mind wrapped around it and figure yeah. out what you want to do. And are we fighting for something worth fighting for? And I would say the answer is yes. Oh, for, absolutely. For the most part, you know, uh, you, you, you got to give it what you can. One of the valuable things about reading, actually just the act of reading a book. It's fundamental. It, it, well, it, that's what they tell us, right? But what's really great about it is it takes you your consciousness inward. I don't know what you mean. So everything we do throughout the day takes our conscious awareness outward. 
you know, we're listening to somebody else. We're looking at someone else. We're talking. Uh, we're, we're on the computer. We're on the Internet. We're on Facebook, whatever. Uh, we're having conversations. Our attention is leaving us and, and it's out, it's external. And that's OK. But that's sort of exhausting. We don't have a lot of moments in our life where we have internal focus, bring our attention and our consciousness back to our internal self. Reading is a wonderful way to take a message and bring it in as opposed to spending so much time on the outward attention. Another example of that, which I know you wanted to talk about today, is meditation. Yes. Meditation is the ultimate way of having an inward focus. And inward focus changes how your brain is functioning for those moments. And it's very restful and restorative to your body and your mind. So couple of things here. So I, I go to the gym six days a week. I'm not bragging or boasting, but I just do that for my own mental clarity, my own physical yeah, health, and everything good. that works for me. And so far it works, so I'm not ditching it. But I do love the 20 to 30 minutes I get on uh, the elliptical because I got a blown out hip, and so I can't run. Right. Uh, I was never really good at it anyways. But I, th- those 30 minutes are I have so many conversations inside my head. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that's the, about the only time in a day that I get inside my head because of my personality and who I am. I'm always looking for this to this, to connect these pieces, to say this, to do this, I'm always focused outwards. And so when you say that, that really hit home because I was like, oh, I do that every day. I get up inside my head and I have full blown conversations. Like, what are we going to do today? And my mind will be like, well, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. You know, my lips aren't moving and I'm like, okay, cool. And it's your internal dialogue. Yeah. I make a mental checklist and I go, okay, these are things that really need attention today. Uh, This thing we could probably push away for a little bit more. Uh, but I, I really do like that. And I have found myself now I'm, I'm not a meditator like you are. Um, I'm in case of emergency type meditator, you know what I mean? <laughs> Where there's like a, a fire extinguisher behind a glass. Yeah, I like it. And so like, uh, I don't know if it's the holidays or whatever it is, but I've been getting panic attacks a little more frequent. Oh, okay. Um, not, not debilitating like they once were because a lot of them were alcohol induced and coming off that, but where I wake up in the middle of the night and I just feel it, feel it, feel it. And so I, I do that, the corner breathing, the four square breathing Good. and, and, and close my eyes and take me to somewhere and I I let the the memories pass over. I acknowledge them and send them away. But in, in the old days, a bad memory would come and, and, and hang over me like a dark cloud. And then I would take that son of a gun everywhere with me all day long. And it would just dominate the rest of my day. Let me ask you this, because some people, believe it or not, would say, well, but if I try to, you know, push that away or deal with that in a different way, then I'm going to forget to work on that problem. So was it ever helpful to you to have that dark cloud following you around? Never. Yeah. Never. And be, Because... I, that's an excuse I hear from people occasionally on why they shouldn't do the meditation and that sort of thing. My mind races a million miles an hour. So when bad thought comes in here, there's like a there's like a corral of a bunch of other bad thoughts going, oh, he's on the bad thought train. Let's get in there. Let's get yeah. in there. You know what I mean? And next thing right. I know. I'm, I'm next. I'm next. Yeah, I'm surrounded by all of them. So, and some of them are legitimate. Some of them are silly. Uh, you know, that. but in my mind or in my conscious, I think this needs some attention. So sometimes I'll go, well, that's just silly. And I'll pass it down. Mm-hmm. And sometimes over the course of a week, the same thought will come over four times and I'll go, okay, well, I think we probably ought to deal with this. There's probably something here yeah, yeah. that we've got, you know what I mean? It's popped up enough to where I've probably got to do this. But but it's the meditation that helps you determine yeah. w- what needs to be dealt with and what doesn't, right? Yeah, and, and if it just, if it hangs over my head, then I'm ignoring my kids or I'm ignoring my other obligations right. and I got to do that. And, and I don't, I can't carry that around all day because I've got other things to do, but I know it's there. I send it down there and I make a mental note of it and I go, okay, we've got to, we've got to get to yeah. that. And if I don't get to it, it'll come back. Yeah. If it's important, it'll come back. Yeah. Right? You know, and sometimes I just gone. But I, so I, I do like meditation. I, I should be better. And maybe that we talked about in the first segment is that maybe I should get better at that and, and try to work on well, it. Well, I, I mean, I, I think anybody who's so inclined, some some very traditional transcendental meditation twice a day, it's hard to beat that. However, finding meditative activities is also a really good thing to do. And I think you mentioned two of them uh, today. One of them is when you're on the elliptical and the other is when you're working out. Now, sometimes I know working out, you may be social and talking to somebody, but when you're in those moments, going for a walk, going for a bike ride, you're on the elliptical, uh, these sorts of moments when you can be internally focused, 
calming and quieting your mind. They have the potential at least, they're not always, but they have the potential to be sort of meditation light. And so at least that's something you do every day. And now we're going to throw Ryan, our producer. He's just filling in for Josh, who's on vacation, a little uh, curveball here. Oh, yeah. Uh, because um, we've got some guided meditations that Dr. Matt did a while back. And so I'm going to have them repost those to the top of our uh, oh okay. our, our, our links. Yeah. And so if you ever wanted to take a guided meditation or just see what it's about, we have, I think, three of them. And Dr. Matt will take you on there and, 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 and just sure. give it a taste. Give it a test. See what you like. Yeah, th- th- those are fun to do, and uh, you know, uh, there's no risk in it. It's one of those things that's great. You can't, you know, it's not going to cost not you anything. risky. Nope. Yeah. All right, so uh, you brought something with us all the way from the beautiful uh, city of Bountiful, Utah. Right. I wanted to share some holiday cheer, the traditional Bountiful holiday gift. Yeah. Of the Paces Darianne footlong hot dog. Oh, hot dog. Yeah. Associated it's, with Christmas. Uh, th- this, well. It's not like monkey bread uh, or chocolate covered pretzels. Bountiful. Every, anybody who's been to Bountiful, they know. I've been to Bountiful. Bountiful's known for, at, at the holidays, everyone sharing with friends and family the, the Paces Darianne uh, foot long hot dog. Did you for know that? Did you know? Roasting yeah. On an open yeah, that's, fire. Our, that's our version in yeah. mean, Bountiful. Yeah. Yeah, no, none of that's true. I'm trying to start a new tradition, though. Well, let's the, see. The these Bountiful, bad boys. yeah. I mean, I've been to the Paces Darianne. We get Pace popsicles at my house, and, and, and they're, ooh. Yeah, now these are the real deal. These are the real deal. You got Here one for you go. Ryan? Incoming, Ryan. You ready? Catch that hot dog. There oh. you go. Throwing hot dogs yeah, in the yeah, studio. Incoming. I'm pretty sure there's a no eating or drinking rule yeah, in this. Yeah, there is. There okay. is. We're told not to eat or drink oh in. Oh, my gosh. But this is the holiday, bountiful, paces. Split down uh, the middle, it looks right? like. Split down the middle, grilled. Grilled? Uh, with the skinny bun. You don't want you don't want too much bun. You want just enough bun. I like big buns, and I don't And you don't cannot lie. lie. Yeah. yeah, I know. But this is a big bun. It's just long. It's a long bun, a long, foot-long hot dog. Okay, I want everybody... You know, uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays uh, from me and Bountiful to you guys. Oh, you want to touch hot dogs? No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> kind of got weird there We're for to- a second. <laughs> I'm toasting you, but I don't want you touching my hot dog. Okay, gotcha. All right, here we go. Uh-huh. Mm. Is there relish on that? There's relish. Mm. You, got, you have three hot dog ingredients. You should never have more than three. Okay. You should always have the relish. Yeah. Ketchup, not too much, uh-huh. and a good strip, one line, yep. mustard. Yellow okay. mustard, nothing fancy. That's a good dog. That is a good dog. That's the holiday. <laughs> Do you think this is going to catch on? I don't know. Yeah, um, I think it will. Look at Ryan. Ryan was, I think he's looking up houses in Bountiful right yeah, now. He's right, planning right, to move. Right next to Paces. Mm-hmm. Go get you a Paces Popsicle and a holiday hot dog. <laughs> As we end this episode of Project Recovery and the new year lurking just around the corner, uh, I want to say thank you to everybody out there who has made this podcast a reality. Uh, without our guests, without KSL, without Bonneville International, without Dr. Matt, without my girlfriend, without my ex-wife, without my kids. I mean, really, this wouldn't be possible without our friends at knowyourscript.org. I mean, those guys are amazing and they give us the backing to be able to do the show. We miss Josh, but we have Ryan today. Yeah. I mean, we have great producers and great support here at KSL. The, the crazy thing is, is that this has become a legitimate community. Uh, it, it, it's helping people. It's giving people a better understanding of loved ones who are going through addiction, uh, which what we said when we started this three years ago is that that's what we wanted, just to have a open conversation, a better understanding of what addiction is. You know, I was going to do this thing on my Facebook and I'm still going to do it. When I was in radio, you know, 20 years ago, we would do uh, fundraisers for breast cancer awareness. And one of the things we'd do is we'd sit down in an arena and we'd say, everybody at a table. And we go, raise your hand if you've been affected with breast cancer and you get four or five. Now raise your hand if you or someone you know has been affected by breast cancer. Or then it would go to someone who's lost their life. And by the end of the, the speech, everybody was standing up. Yeah. Now, if you did that with addiction right now, everybody in that room would be standing up. But 10 years ago, you'd have the same results, but no to be standing up because people would be worried about what people were going to say about the stigma. Them. The stigma. Right. And I think we're doing a lot here to reduce and lessen the stigma when it comes to addiction because it really is affecting 
everyone. I don't know anybody out there who hasn't been affected by some sort of addiction. Oh, absolutely. And if you haven't, you haven't asked the right questions. You you don't you're not aware. Yeah. You're not aware. Yeah. So thank you. We want to wish you a happy and merry new year uh, and may everything come to you. And remember, you don't need to be a new you in the new year. Just work to be a better you. Love it. Love you. I love everybody out there. Thank you for stopping by. This is Project Recovery. And what is it, Dr. Matt? Hey, you know Project Recovery? It's a KSL podcast. I love what you did there.